All right, our next speaker is Dr. Stephen Pigeon, and he hails from Seattle. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to make it, like a few of our other speakers who will be presenting virtually. Uh, we will play his presentation for you now. Thank you. Good afternoon, it's Dr. Stephen Pigeon here, coming to you again from an undisclosed location deep in the heart of Great Britain. Yes, I was gonna speak with a wee bit of the accent here, but they told me that it was more Irish that I'd have to leave and head for Dublin if I kept it up. So I've switched back to a fine American uh, discourse here. And today we're gonna be talking about something that is really quite interesting, and it's, uh, it's good to be in Britain for this particular, this particular uh, uh, discussion because we're going to be talking about the histories of the crossing millennium. Now, this is a big deal because we're talking about, uh, I began this kind of discussion at uh, crossing over a couple of weeks back, where we were talking about who are these people in the New Testament or the Brit Hadashah? Who are these people? We see a lot of discussion saying a certain man here and a certain person here and a certain woman here, and, but who were these people? We don't know. But what we can look at is we can start to discuss some of the history that we can find within scripture and see what we've got going on. Because I think we're gonna find that what is being revealed is actually a very close knit family. Now, when we get into this discussion, I wanna kind of uh, preface these remarks here a little bit with the fact that <clears throat> we're gonna be talking about some really kind of critical families that were a big part of what would happen with uh, this coming Messiah. First of all, we have uh, you know two different bloodlines that are given in Matthew 1 and in Luke 3. And these are very, very important. We're gonna discuss these in detail during the course of this show. But you're going to see that you have a lineage in Matthew 1 that is from David through Solomon. And then if you look in Luke 3, you're gonna see that that lineage is David through Nathan or Nathan. And that lineage that appears in Luke 3 is a much longer lineage than is the lineage in Matthew 1. Matthew 1, it says there were 42 generations from Abraham to the Messiah, 14 from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the taking away of to Babylon, and 14 from the taking away to Babylon to the Mashiach. But there's many more generations in the generations that follow in Luke 3. But what we do see here is we see very conspicuously the house of Judah in, in the line of Ferez, Ferez. Um, and when you compare that to the house of Judah in the line of Zarak, you don't find a lot of biblical history for the line of Zarak, the firstborn of Judah. And just to preface that, remember that the story goes that Tamar, who gave birth to these twins, Zarach and Perez, that Zarach was the first one to come out. His hand came out and the midwife tied a red string around the hand, indicating that it was the first to breach the matrix, therefore the firstborn. And under Torah, the firstborn has the right of primogenitor, primogenitor, like Reuben would have. And so, so Zarach had the right of primogenitor under Judah. But nonetheless, the bloodlines we see discussed that appear in both Matthew 1 and in Luke 3 come through, you know, it's Abraham, then Yitzhak, then Yaakov, then Judah, which was the fourth born, and then from Judah, not through Reuben, but rather from Judah comes his two sons, which are Zarak and Perez. And so when you see Perez, Perez or Perez, quite often you'll see it in some manuscripts as Perez, but when you're talking about this group who called themselves the Pharisees, you were talking about people who were trying to claim lineage direct to Pharez, were Pharisees, were of Pharez, of the house of Pharez, as compared to the Zadokim, we often, often refer to it by the Greek name Sadducees, but they were Zadokim, they were claiming a direct lineage to Zadok in the house of Levi of the sons of Aharon, the father of the Levites, of the Levite priesthood. So we see some very interesting things. The Sadducees who claimed Levitical heritage, and at the time of Mashiach, most of, none, almost none of them had true Levitical heritage. There were some exceptions. And then the Pharisees, almost none of whom had actual lineage to Pharez. Yet Matthew 1 and Luke 3 both record that on both sides of the family, both Miriam and Yosef, that they were in direct lineage 
to David, one through Nathan and the other through Solomon. And from David, the lineage goes back to Perez, the son of Judah. So this is one camp. So you have this camp of Judah on this side. You have another camp that says Sadokim, were of the, were the house of the Levites. And then there were two very ex important camps. The, the Edomite camp, which is going to be represented by Herod the Great, and the Hasmonean camp, that is to say the line of the Maccabees, which is going to be represented by Shimon Maccabee and his lineage. And what we're going to come to discover is that the Maccabees, and I, don't, I didn't have a time to look at all of this research because we're concentrating on the millennium, but it's very interesting that uh, during the time of Abraham, Abraham left and he was told, you're going to be the father of many nations. And this promise has since come true. And it, it is very true. And, he, and in fact, the word used there is Melo Goyim. Melo, you know, Abraham, you're going to be the father of the Melo Goyim, which in the Latin is Gentile, right? Abraham is the father of many Gentiles or many other nations, Melo Goyim, right? Many nations. But he left his father Tarak and his brother Nahor. And Nahor, as First Chronicles records, he was also very prolific. He had eight sons with his wife, and he had four sons with his concubine. One of those sons from the concubine was this son named Makkah. Now, I believe that that is a scriptural source for this family that would be called the Makkabim, the Maccabees, the Maccabim. They may have believed they were of the house of Judah, but I don't think so. I think they were Kasdim or Chaldeans, that they were come from the house of Makkah, the son of the concubine of Nahor, the brother of Abraham. And so you have this, you're, you know, you're not in the family of Abraham. So the Maccabim, they sought to become the chosen people. They sought to be included in this, in this, uh, in this mess, but they were not because they were of the house of Nahor. Now, it's very interesting, we have the Chasdim, we call them the Chasdim in the Sefer. They were also known as the Chaldeans, the Chaldeans. And so the Chaldeans, the Chasdim, the Chaldi, the Chaldi was short, Chaldeans, Chaldi, the Chaldi would become the Kelti, the Kelti would become the Celtic, the Celtic people of Central Europe. These are, uh, this is a remnant from the Chaldeans, from the house of the Chasdim, the sons of Nahor, the sons of Nahor. Now, one of these, uh, one of these, this is going to become important because one of these family members now is going to end up as the king of Armenia. Any of you who have been to, to Israel and have been to Jerusalem, you know that the old city is divided up into four camps. It's divided up into the Muslim camp, the Jewish camp, the Christian quarter, right? The Christian quarter, Jewish quarter, Muslim quarter. And then you have what? The Armenian quarter. Well, wait, now, wait a minute. Okay, I understand Islam. Judaism, Christian, okay, this is the three largest, you know, three big religions in the world, or three notable religions in the world. And then Armenia, what's, how come Armenia gets a quarter of Jerusalem? Because Armenia turns out to be extremely important. And I think what you're going to find that this house of Macha, this house of Macha, the son of Nahor, this house actually has this heritage right to Armenia, to Armenia. But in the middle of this thing, this house, this Hasmonean house, which uh, Herod replay he and he uh, ultimately beheaded Antigonus, the last Hasmonean king who was in Jericho, to claim full reign over the you know the area that we now call Israel, who used to be called Palestine, whatever it was called. This area uh, that Herod co uh, that commanded, uh, you know, even though he beheaded Antigonus, there was intermarriage that took place between the house of Herod, who had ten wives, and this Hasmonean dynasty. And between the Hasmonean dynasty and the house of Herod, they are blood related to some of the disciples. Now, so this is going to be something, a very interesting question. And as we look at that, I, want, I just want to throw this out to you. When you consider this aspect, consider, if you will, that, uh, that what we're talking about here is we're talking about a ver that with the salvation that came upon the cross, even though Mashiach says, I've come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, with the salvation that comes upon the cross, there is neither Greek nor Jew, male or female, before the cross, but that all are equal before the cross in every calling, that it is a calling of faith, it's a calling of belief, it's a calling of expression, it's a calling of adoption through the blood that causes each and every one of us, no matter what your lineage is, to be grafted in. There, there were no branches left on the vine. They were all cut off. Every single person of every tribe, every nation, every color has to be grafted back into the vine. The vine is not Judaism. 
The vine is the truth of the word, the word which was here before time began, which was manifest and made flesh in the physical aspects of Yahusha HaMashiach. Okay? All right, so let's jump into our discussion here today, and let's see what we can come up with. I'm going to share a little screen here. So let's begin here. The histories of the crossing millennium. All right. So. Move this up here just a second. We start with the Hasmonean dynasty, okay? Shimon Maccabee, the brother of Yehuda Maccabee, or Judas Maccabeus, right? In, in the Greek, Judas Maccabeus. At which time Shimon rose up. Now, this is from the book of First Maccabees. At which time Shimon rose up and fought for his nation and spent much of his own substance and armed the valiant men of his nation and gave them wages and fortified the cities of Yehuda, together with Beit Surah, that lies upon the borders of Yehuda, and where the armor of the enemies had been before, he set up a garrison of Yahudim there. Okay, so this is the beginning of the reign of Shimon Maccabee. The people therefore sang the acts of Shimon, and under what glory he thought to bring his nation made him their governor, or Melech, and chief priest, Sadiq. Okay, so here you see, now this is what's so interesting about this, because, you know, you go back to the time of Shem, and the time of Melchizedek, uh, you know, Melchizedek, of course, Melchizedek, we give it a capital M in most English Bibles, but really two word, Melech, Melechi, Melechi, our king, Melech, Melechi, Sadiq our righteous king, or even better said, king and priest, Melchi Sadiq. You're talking about king and priest in the same person. You see, this was divided by Yaakov when he blessed his sons in Genesis 49, putting the scepter and the lawgiver between the feet of Judah or Yehuda and giving instead the, the, uh, the, the, the kingship went to him, but the birthright went to Yosef. The birthright went to Yosef and the priesthood went to Levi, the priesthood went to Levi, the birthright went to Yosef, but the kingship went to Yehuda. Here we see the Maccabees come in and say, hey, now I'm going to become governor and chief priest. I'm going to become both the king and the chief priest. Very unusual. Hezekiah tried it, ended up with leprosy, trying to walk into the Holy of Holies. Suddenly, Shimon Maccabee has the right to walk into the Holy of Holies, to reclaim a temple, to reclaim what he believed to be Jerusalem, and to come in and say, I'm king and priest, Melchi Tzedek, because he had done all these things and for the justice and faith which he kept to his nation, for he sought by all means to exalt his people. Now, this is an interesting question. This is assuming that his people were, in fact, the Yahudim and not the Kastim who were seeking, you know, entrance into, uh, into the, the promised land or into the chosen people, right? For in his time, things prospered in his hands so that the heathen were taken out of their country. And they also that were in the city of David in Yerushalayim, who had made themselves a tower, out of which they issued and polluted all about the sanctuary and did much to hurt in the holy place. Now, of course, 1 through 4 Maccabees tells us about this in great detail, because it talks about how Antiochus Epiphanes, the self-appointed God, who thought he was self-appointed God, who would later die ignominiously, came in there and set up a statue of Jupiter in the Holy of Holies and sacrificed pork on the altar and turned the outer court into a gymnasium, which, you know, in the Jewish world, a gymnasium is anathema because of what gymnasiums brought, all right? So the Hasmonean dynasty begins here with Shimon Maccabee. Now, let's look at this dynasty for a minute. Let's see who these people are. Shimon Maccabee, who was then, the throne would go to Yochanan Hyrcanus, or John Hyrcanus, and from 110 to 104 B.C., then to Aristobulus I. Now, this name Aristobulus is going to become more and more present. It's a very popular name during this period of time. But we see Aristobulus I ruling over this area from 104 to 103 BC. Then Alexander Aeneas, uh, Ian, uh, excuse me, 103 to 76 BC, a longtime ruler. Then Salome Alexander, actually a male, 76 to 67. Hyrcanus II, okay, for what runs rules for one year. And then we have Aristobulus II, who rules for three years. Hyrcanus II returns. And then, of course, his last predecessor, Hyrcanus II under Rome. And then, so Rome now expands into the province there in Judea, right around 60 BC. Now, Hyrcanus is replaced by Antigonus, who in 37 BC, uh, Antigonus is executed. Now, 
at this time, unbeknownst to most people, most people don't talk about this in terms of its historical record, but the Parthian Empire was an extremely significant empire. It was kind of a successor to Medo-Persia, but this was an empire that was governed and ruled by the House of Reuben. And the House of Reuben, who had been taken out into, uh, you know, taken out east following the destruction of the Second Kingdom in 722 BC, they formed a city called Carmi, Carmi, which uh, Carmeni, they, the people were called Carmeni, Carmi was the city. Uh, Josephus refers to them as Germani, 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 uh, who would later become the, uh, you know, when they, when they migrated into Germany, they would be part of that, that house. The Parthian Empire, very strong, very powerful, defeated Rome in several things. And, and ultimately in the second century, the Parthians would take on Rome in a, in a battle that was the equivalent of World War I, where each side lost millions of men. Each side lost millions of men. It was one of the big battles, one of the first uh, significant European wars, if you will, of course, it was fought in the Middle East. But it crippled Western Rome. Uh, Western Rome had to rely on mercenaries from that point forward because they had lost a whole generation of men. And it also crippled the Parthians. And the Parthians, at, following that huge war, they moved north. They took their entire tribes and moved up into uh, north Eastern Europe, if you will. I'm not, I'm not all the way into Russia. I'm talking about into Germany, into Scandinavia, uh, into Poland, in that whole area. The Parthians were, were quite robust up into Khazaria, that area. They moved all of the house of, there were 12 tribes of Israel in Parthia, and they all moved north. They went up north, and they, because they were outflanking Rome, they were going to a better turf, a little cooler turf. They were going to a better turf where they could industrialize, where they could build, and they outflanked Rome by moving north. Okay? All right. Now, let's take a look. So we're going to see here, this is the, this is the lineage here of the Maccabean priesthood. I'll put this up because this is what we're talking about, of course, is lineage, right? And so uh, here's what we're talking about. Matthias, uh, Matith, uh, Matith, Matathias, or Matathias, this was the father. And then of course, he, here's all his sons, John Gaddy, Shimon Maccabee, right? who was the high priest, Judas Maccabeus, who was a high priest, Eleazar Abran, and Jonathan Maccabeus, the high priest. Now, ultimately what would happen here is that Judah Maccabeus, Judah Maccabee was the one who conquered most of the land and died in his 22nd battle, coincidentally. And then Shimon Maccabee would take over as the king. And then he would have three sons, Judah, Mattathias, or Mattathias and John Hyrcanus I. And John Hyrcanus I would then take over as ruler. John Hyrcanus then, would have Aristobulus I and Alexander Yanninus and Antigonus and Absalom. These are his sons, right? And then Alexander Salome ruled on kind of outside the family there for a little bit, but then Hyrcanus II takes over and Aristobulus II, right? And Aristobulus II has a couple of kids, Antigonus, Metathias, and Alexander. And of course, now it's very important here that we see that Aristobulus II, right? He has a son named Alexander. He has another son named Antigonus Metathias. Now, Antigonus is the one who would be executed in 37 BC by Herod, who was, who was running Judea at that point. But look at who Herod's wife is. Herod marries Mary Omni I, who was the daughter of Alexander, the brother of Antigonus. The very guy he beheaded was, you know, was the, the brother of his brother-in-law, right? Or excuse me, of his father-in-law, the brother of his father-in-law, he beheaded. And he ends up marrying Mary Amney the first. Okay, this is going to prove to be a little bit more interesting. Now, this name Mary Amney is also going to feature large in our discussion. Aristobulus, Mary Amney, maybe the name Herod, they're going to figure large. Okay, now let's take a look and let's see what we have in there. Now, if you look over here in the far right hand here, you'll see that what we're talking about, here's the, here's the lineage in the, of the Maccabees. Shimon Maccabee, John Hyrcanus, Aristobulus I, Alexander Yanaeus, Hyrcanus II, Aristobulus II, Antigonus, and Aristobulus III. Now, so Antigonus, even though he was beheaded, had a son, Aristobulus III. Aristobulus III would have a son named Aristobulus IV. This Aristobulus IV marries Salome, who was the daughter of Herod II and Herodias. Also, Herodias, was, Herod II was the son of Herod the Great through Mary Amni. Herodias was the daughter of Herod the Great through Mary Amni, uh, yeah, through Mary Amni the First. So, or excuse me, uh, the daughter of Aristobulus, the son of Herod the Great. So, you know, Philip here is marrying his first cousin. 
And so this is, so you see Mariamne II now is going to arrive here. So Mariamne I, Herod the Great married her, and then he married another gal named Mariamne II, who was actually of the Levite line. Again, trying to create some kind of, you know, legitimacy for holding king and priest in Judea. And this is what he's trying to do. So you see here with this bloodline here, we've got some very interesting things happening because Aristobulus IV marries Salome, at least according to Josephus, that was her name, and he becomes the king of Armenia. Aristobulus of Chalcis became the king of Armenia. So here you're talking a guy who is out of, you know, he's in the direct line of the Maccabees, of the kings of the Maccabees, and he marries an heiress, if you will, from Herod the Great. He marries the heiress from Herod the Great. He marries the very woman that had suggested that John the Baptist be beheaded. And what's interesting here now is that they had some children. Well, who did they have for children? Well, one of them was a fellow named Matthias Barna Aristobulus, for short, Matthias Barnabas. Matthias Barnabas. Now, in the Welsh, he is known as Mana, and he died in 18, he died in 73 AD. This is Barnabas, right? This is the, the uh, you know, when you talk about uh, the, 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 the fellow who went along with Paul, right, Barnabas, according to the book Ascents of James, which can be found in the Et Sefer publication Havot, you'll see that what we're talking about here is a Barnabas, Matthias Barna, Aristobulus, Matthias Barnabas, they identified that the apostle that was selected by the 11 remaining in the book of Acts, they said, well, we're going we're gonna to select an apostle. They, they wanted to select Stephen, but he was stoned to death by, you know, friends of Paul, right? And Paul took their coats while they were stoning him. And, and instead, they appointed Matthias. I mean, Matthias, they don't tell us that his last name was Barnabi or Barna Aristobulus or Barnabas, Barnabas, Matthias Barnabas. And so this Barnabas here, boom, here he is, the son of Aristobulus IV. Well, they also had a son named Aristobulus V. And you can see here that he marries Mary Amni III, right? Mary Amni III. Well, I mean, where does Mary Amni come from? Well, let's trace her bloodline back. Well, she was the daughter of Agrippa II. You know, this is the guy who was on the throne when Paul was being adjudicated, Agrippa II in Acts 25, right? And Agrippa II was married to the very popular, very famous Bernice of Judea. Bernice of Judea. So Agrippa II married to Bernice of Judea. But who was Bernice of Judea? Well, guess what? She was his first cousin, you know, once removed, right? Because she is the daughter of, Her of Herodias and Herod the Tetrarch, the natural daughter of that marriage. In other words, Salome's little sister, Bernice of Judea, she ends up marrying Agrippa II. And they are the father of Mariamne III, who marries Aristobulus V. Agrippa I's father, which was Agrippa the first, he was the son of Herodias and Herod the Tetrarchs. I mean, you know, you look, these relations are a little bit close, obviously by in violation of Torah, didn't stop them. Now, when we get down here, we're going to see a very interesting relation that takes place right here. We're going to see what that looks like, but let's continue. I know that I hope you guys are um, fascinated by this chart and not looking at this chart going, hey, you know, get, get this out or I don't know what you're talking about. Anyway, this is what we're doing, so that's what I'm talking about. All right. So, so all the generations, now let's take a look, let's go to, back to this lineage and talk about what we find in Matthew 1. For all the generations from Abraham to David are 14, and from David until the carrying away into Babel are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babel unto Mashiach are 14 generations. Okay, all right, great. 14, 14, 14, that equals 42. Why not 49? That's a question. Why do we have 42 and not 49? Why didn't we count all the way back to uh, Adam? Why do we count only back to Abraham? And there's, these are reasons that are, you know, I mean, this is the very first chapter of the New Testament, right? Matthew 1. The yeah, very first discussion point. This is what we're talking about, the genealogies. Why are there 42? Why is it not 49? Why is it not 70? Why is it not 120? Why isn't it decided? You know, we have this number. Okay, now, so let's count them. Let's count them and see what we got. The Sefer of the generation of Yahshua HaMashiach, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Yitzhak, Yitzhak begat Yaakov, Yaakov begat Yehuda and his brethren. So we see Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Yehuda, Perez, right? Right there, Perez, Perez, right? Chetzron, Aram, Aminadav, Nachson, Salma, Boaz. You see here, Boaz of Rakhov. See, there's a woman named here. You see this? Boaz of Rakhov, right? Then we have Ovid, number 12, of Ruth, 
Now see, a second woman, we're not counting her. We, we, don't, we don't count Rachav. We don't count Ruth. Count Oved is number 12. Then we count Yishai as number 13. And Yishai begat David, number 14, the king. Okay, so the first 14, bingo, we're right there. We got 14. Let's go to the next. And David the king can't count him. We already counted him. We got one Shalomah, right? And the, who was the woman of Uriah? Who? So we don't count Bathsheba here. We don't count her. We, we because, Even though she's mentioned, she's not counted in the list. So Shalomah, one. Who begat Rechavam? That's two. Who begat Abiyahu, three. Then Asa, four. Then Yahushaphat, five. Then Yoram, six. Then Uzziah, that's seven. Then eight Yotham, then nine Achaz, then ten Yikiskiyahu, then Yikiskiyahu, then Manasseh, the evil king, number 11. Then Manasseh begat Ammon, that's 12. And then Yoshayahu, that's 13. And Yoshayahu begat Yekonyahu and his brethren. Okay? So people go back to first king and go, well, what about Yehoiakim? And what about Yehoiakim? And what about Zedekiah? Those were the brethren of Yekonyahu and Yekonyahu because he was taken away to Babel, he was still the king. These guys were just kind of filling, his brothers were just filling in for him because he was still living. He was still the king. Okay. But we see, boom, we got another 14 to the taking away of Babel. So there's 14 generations from David to the taking away of Babel. All right. That's all equating. That's all coming out well. Now let's take a look here. Okay. Then after they were brought into Babel, Yekun Yahu begat, we can't count him. We already counted him. Now Shealtiel, that's one. Then Zerubbabel, that's two. Then Abihud, that's three. Then Elakim, that's four. Then Azur, that's five. Then Sadok, that's six. Then Yokim, that's seven. Eliel, that's eight. Nine Elazar, ten Matan, eleven Yaakov, twelve Yosef, the father of Miriam, right? Because if it's the husband of Miriam, we're done counting. Yosef, the husband of Miriam, that's twelve. And then Mashiach, that's thirteen. Because we already, you don't count Ruth, you don't count Rakov, you don't count Bathsheba, so you're not going to count Miriam. Because the DNA does not equate from husband to wife, right? Yosef, the father of Miriam, that's Yosef number 12. Miriam then is number 13, of whom was born Yahusha, who's called Mashiach. Is this relevant? Of course it is. Look, go back to Bereshith, Genesis chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. And Yahweh Elohim said unto the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field, and upon your belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and it shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So we have to talk about when, we, when this prophecy of the Mashiach coming against HaSatan, this prophecy of, the, of him coming against HaSatan has to do with the seed of the woman. So whereas we don't count Bathsheba, whereas we don't count Rakab, whereas we don't count Ruth, we do count Miriam because suddenly we're talking about the seed of the woman. Well, Steve, that can't be true because, you know, we're, we're talking about Joseph, the husband of Miriam. All right, well, let's take a look. Let's go see what it says in Luke 3 and see if we get the same lineage. And Yahusha himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed, the son of Yosef. So which, who, which Yosef are we talking about? We're talking about the Yosef that was married to Miriam. That's who we're talking about, because he wasn't supposed to be the son of some other Yosef. He was supposed to be the son of Yosef who was married to Miriam. So then we're going to see what the lineage looks like. Okay, the son of Yosef, who was the son of Eli. Wait, wait a minute, I don't remember that name being in there. The son of Matith Yahu, I don't remember that. The son of Levi, I don't remember that. The son of Malki, I don't remember that name. Son of Yana, no, nope, don't remember that. The son of Yosef, well, there, I guess there was one in there. The son of Matith Yahu, again, the son of Amotz, the son of Nahum, the son of Eliyav Avni Anai, and the son of Noga. all right? Now, this is just in the first instance. Let's keep going. Let's see if we have any more cross up. Which was the son of Ma'at? Nope, didn't appear in the last list. Son of Matith Yahu? No. Nope. Son of Shemi? No. Nope. Son of Yosef? Another one. Son of Yehuda? Well, at some point. Son of Yochanan? Nope. Son of Rephiah? No, that didn't appear in the list. Son of Zerubbabel? Okay, that name. Son of Shealtiel? Which was the son of Neriyahu? Not the son of Yekonyahu. Shealtiel, the son of Yekonyahu? No, no, no. This is a different Shealtiel because he's the son of Neriyahu which was the son of Malki, which was the son of Adi, the son of Kesem, which was the son of Almodad, the son of Ur. Well, let's keep going. You see how many more names we have here in this collection, which was the son of Yosef, the son of Eliezer, the son of Yoram, the son of Matithyahu, the son of this multiple generations past what would have been Yekonyahu, right? The son of Matthew, the son of Levi, the son of Shimon, the son of Yehuda, the son of Yosef, the son of Yochanan, the son of Elohim, the son of Milad, the son of Menan, the son of Matithyahu, the son of Natan, 
right down here, the son of Natan, which was the son of David. Boom. So the lineage that's expressed in Luke 3 is a lineage that springs from the son of Nathan, the son of David, by the way, who was an older brother to Solomon. Nathan, who, who also, by the way, was probably the prophet Nathan, who wrote the book of Nathan that's not included in scripture or is integrated into the book of Kings. But you see here that the book of Nathan, the son of Nathan, the son of David, not Solomon, the son of David, that we see in Matthew 1. Matthew 1, we have a whole list of kings and the kings that were exiled. Here, we have the lineage of the throne of David through Nathan, through Nathan. Okay, very important. All right. And Yahushua himself began to be about 30 years of age, but being as was supposed, the son of Yosef, which was the son of Eli. Now, when you read in most of your English text, you're going to read the son of Heli, H-E-L-I, Heli, the son of Heli. But the true uh, Hebrew expression for that name is Eli, like uh, Eliyahu or Elisha, right? A, a common name, it means El is my, is my Yah. El is my Yah. You know, El is mine. Eli, Eli. So if his name was Eli, now consider, let's consider this for just a minute. About the ninth hour, Yahusha cried out with a loud voice from the cross saying, Eli, Eli, lama azaftani. That is to say, Eli, Eli, why have you forsaken me? Now, we know that just before he died on the cross, he told, he told uh, Pontius Pilate, look, I take up my life and I lay it down. Nobody else does it. I do it. Nobody else does it, right? This is what he says. I take it up. I lay it down. Nobody else does it. Now, all of a sudden, we read this and we think, oh, well, he's, you know, he's calling out to Yah, Eli, 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 my L, my L, why have you forsaken me, right? Eli, Eli, why have you forsaken me? Well, yeah, I mean, that's probably true, that maybe that was what he was doing. Maybe not, because this, of course, Eli, Eli, Lama Azatani is a direct quote from Psalm 22, or Tehillim 22, uh, yeah, Tehillim 22, with an extremely important psalm that prophesies of the crucifixion with quite ex express detail, including this phrase, Eli, Eli, Lama Azaptani. However, what if he was just speaking to his grandfather, right? Eli, Eli, why have you forsaken me? Why aren't you here? Why aren't you here at the cross? Now, let's think about this for a minute. Nowhere in, in, the, in the biblical story do we see any mention of Yosef, the husband of Miriam, after Mashiach turns 12. I mean, after he returns, he's been, you know, they, they left him behind. He's teaching in the temple. He's 12 years old. They come back. Okay, look, we got you got to come with us, kid. You're too smart for your own good. Let's get you out of here. That's the last time you hear about Yosef. That's the last time you heard about him. Well, what happened to him? Well, most assuredly, he must have died sometime before we ever get to the crucifixion. Now, if he died before we ever get to the crucifixion, then we've got a very interesting quandary. We've got a very interesting quandary because there is a passage. Well, let's continue. Let's see what we find here. Uh, you know, there is a passage that talks about one of the disciples comes to him and says, you know, he says, take up your cross and follow me. The disciple says, I want to come, but I need to go bury my father, right? One of his disciples, his father had died. Which one? Was it Yaakov, James? Was it his brother Jude? Was it either one of those? Then we're talking about the death of Joseph. And he says to him, let the dead bury the dead, right? You recall that? Let the dead bury the dead. So there is a question there as to what happened. Was that a reference to Yosef? I don't know, but we know that Yosef was not at the cross and he had no expectation that Yosef was gonna be at the cross. So what remains? His grandfather through his father's side, Eli, and his grandfather through his mother's side, Yosef, the father of Miriam. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Mar the Mariamnes, okay? Mary Amni the first, uh, she married Herod the Great and her sons were Alexander and Aristobulus. Her daughter was Herodias. Okay, that's Mary Amni the first. Mary Anne II also married Herod the Great, and her son was Philip the Tetrarch, who married Herodias, and their daughter was Salome, who married Aristobulus IV. That is the royal house of Armenia, the royal house of Armenia. So the royal house of Armenia, it was a blending of the house of Herod and the house of the Hasmoneans to become the royal house of Armenia, okay? Mary Amni III, daughter of Agrippa II, the wife Bernice of Judea, the son of Agrippa I, the brother of Herodias, Cephas' mother-in-law, Cephas' mother-in-law, Mary Omni III, Cephas' mother-in-law, and her husband was Aristobulus V, the first bishop of Britain, the first bishop of Britain. And Mary Omni IV may have been the name of Cephas' wife. Now, we don't know because there's no record at all of what her name is. However, 
it's very likely and very possible that her name was Mariamne the fourth, Mariamne the fourth, the daughter of Aristobulus the fifth and Mariamne the third, Aristobulus the fifth, who would become the first bishop of Britain. Okay, two Levites and a cousin. Okay, so Aharon the high priest, Aharon the high priest, the Kohen Gadul, he had a daughter, Elisheva, right? This is from Luke 1 5, Elisheva or Elizabeth, that was his daughter. So Aharon, the, high, the chief priest, the Kohen Gadul, he has a daughter, Elisheva. And then Abiyahu, who was a Levite priest in the regular chorus, he has a son named Zechariah or Zacharias or Zachariahu. This is also in Luke 1, 5. And Zachariah marries Elizabeth. Zacharias marries Elizabeth. Zachariahu marries Elisheva in the, in the Hebrew. And they have a son, Yochanan the Immerser. So Yochanan the Immerser now has a direct lineage to Aharon, the high priest, the Kohen Gadul, a true Levite, and who's, so his grandfather was the high priest, the Kohen Gadul, his father was a Levite priest in the, in the order, and his grandfather on his father's side was a Levite priest in the order. So you're talking about somebody, Levite, from both sides, both houses, with a direct lineage to the Kohen Gadul. Now, Anna, who was the sister of Elisheva, was the wife of Eli was the wife of Eli. So this is interesting. So when you see that Eli, uh, Eli, who was of the house of Judah, he married Anna, who was a Levitical woman, a, a woman of the house of Levi, the sister of Elizabeth. So Eli marries uh, Anna, and they have a son, Yosef, who becomes the husband of Miriam. Yosef becomes the husband of Miriam. But they had two daughters, right? One was Miriam, who married Zabdi or Zebedee, right? You remember he was an apostle, Zebedee, Zabdi. And his sons, they would become John and James, the two apostles. John and James, the two apostles, uh, the sons of thunder, right? The sons of thunder, Zebedee, Zabdi. This Zabdi had married Miriam. Their two sons, John and James, become the apostles, the sons of thunder. They had another sister named Anna, who would marry Bran the Blessed, who was of the royal house of Siluria in Britain. And she would take on the name Agnes or Agnes, Agnes, Anna, her Welsh name, Agnes, and she marries Bran the Blessed, the daughter of Ailey, who was the father of Joseph, the husband of Miriam, who was the mother of the Mashiach. So Joseph, the father of Miriam, was a cousin to Eli, okay? Joseph, whoever the father of Miriam was, he was a cousin to Eli. All right. So let's see what happens following the crucifixion. After the 12th year of Mashiach, there is no mention of Yosef, his, his supposed father, save possibly the following passage. And another of his Talmudim said unto him, Adonai, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Yahushua said unto him, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. Matthew Yahu, chapter 8, verses 21 through 22. Was, this is half-brother Jude, Yehuda, who, by the way, was also called Thaddeus or Thaddei? Maybe. Now, Look at this. We're going to talk about another Yosef here. When the even was come, there came a rich man of Ramah, or of Arimathea, named Yosef, who also himself was Yahusha's Talmud, a disciple. He went to Pilate, and he begged the body of Yahusha. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Yosef had taken the body, he wrapped it in what? A clean linen cloth. Yeah, amen and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. Okay, obtaining the body was not something for a non-family member. You don't just come out, hey, I'm rich. You mind if I get the body? And there was a guy that was executed here yesterday. Think about it in your own town. There was a guy here that was executed yesterday. I'm rich, I want the body. No, that's not gonna happen. He didn't donate his body to science. What's your reason, right? So Yosef of Arimathea had to have some familial relationship. He had to be some existing patriarch in the family, not just anybody. And some people say, oh, he was the uncle of Miriam. I don't think so. I think he was the patriarch of the family. I think he was the father of Miriam. Was Yosef the father of Miriam as set forth in Matitiaho? Was that actually Yosef of Arimathea? Very good chance. There's, you know, when you see him getting the body off the cross, putting him in his own tomb, you're not talking about just a disciple. You're talking about somebody who has familial authority. And that person could very well be Yosef, the father of Marian. If so, uh, the record following the crucifixion is proving to be very interesting. Now, let's talk about this for a minute. So I'm going to try to fill this in a little bit because I know I've been rattling on here. 
about all these different people about who they are. But you see that when you look at these bloodlines, you're going to see that the description where, where you see that Akefa's wife's mother was ill and Mashiach comes to her and he heals her. He heals her. Well, that tells you, number one, Kepha, Peter, was married. That's premise number one. And he had a couple of children. And he, when he was, when, you know, when you see this passage that follows, let, your, let the dead bury the dead, another one comes to him and says, I need to go and say goodbye to my wife and family. And he says to him, he who puts his hand to the plow and turns back is not worthy of the kingdom. So he required, I believe that was Peter he was talking to. He required Peter to follow him then without his wife, without his children. And Peter followed him during the course of that ministry, but ultimately would be restored to his wife. And the record reports that both Peter uh, and uh, James and Jude, the two brothers of Mashiach, all were married and their wives participated with them in their ministry and traveled with them in their ministry. Very important part that the Roman church would do well to learn and listen since they claim their lineage to Peter, which by the way is also false and not true. But at any rate, so what you see is, is that you see that there was this marriage relationship. And if his wife was Mary Amney the fourth, the daughter of Mary Amney the third, and Mary Amney the third was married to Aristobulus the fifth, Mary Amney the third and Aristobulus the fifth would live out their lives in Britain, where they would die in Britain, as did Joseph of Arimathea, as did Ailey, the father of Joseph, live out his life in Britain with his daughter Anna, who was married to the king, Brand the Blessed. Uh, and, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, so you see a lot of people who ended up in Britain of that family. And the most important thing to take from all of this is that when you see these connections between the house of Herod, you're not talking about unimportant people here. You know, Miriam was in the line of, you know, the kings of Yehud, she, a direct line to David, to David. She was a, you know, she was in a direct line to David through Solomon, direct line. And you see that Yosef, her husband, was in the secondary line, the line of Nathan from the son of David in a, in a direct line as well. So these people were not, you know, uh, you know, people say, oh, they were, they were poor. We know that the Magi brought in gold, Frankincense, Mir. You know, when they, when they, when the Torah offering was given that, that the, the two, uh, the two doves were given for Miriam to enter the temple after the birth, that's because that's what the offering was. You're not going to come there and slaughter a bull, right? That's what the offering was. That's what she gave. So that's was that. But, you know, when you're talking about, uh, so these people, like, these people were not insignificant people. They were uh, politically very astute, and they were shaping policies between multiple houses, between the house of Herod, between the house of Aristobulus, uh, which was the Armenian king, the house of Herod, which was the Judean king, the house of, of uh, Brandeblest, which was the British king. All of these things were being settled among these people. And in the middle of that comes this faith message that says, all are equal before the cross. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither male nor female, but that all are equal before the cross because the blood was shed for the salvation of everyone. So with that, my friends, I'm going to uh, leave this uh, teaching where it is. Thank you for joining me for this here at the Sacred Word Conference. I want to give my blessings to Zen Garcia and to uh, Justin and Joy Garcia. Thank you for inviting me and thanks to the other speakers who have been tolerating my videos. And I'd like to remind you to come to the Sefer website. Come on in and join us over there. We have a lot of things going on. We've got a lot of new things happening. The uh, Sefer is available now in Spanish. Uh, it's Colección de Escritura, uh, Sagrada Escriturias of Sacred Scripture. It's, a, it's an excellent book. Compra el libro de El Sefer. And uh, I think you're going to love it. And the, um, uh, in addition to that, there are some Spanish blogs. Up. There's also Italian blogs up. We are diligently working on an Italian translation that should be coming at the end of next year. We're working on an Urdu translation to be published in Pakistan uh, to try to reach the Islamic world in Pakistan with the entire with the entirety of sacred scripture that's found in the Et Sefer. And you know, some of these books, like for instance, in the Sefer Spanish edition, and these are some of the first times that Yashar has ever been translated in the Spanish language and that you find this combination of Hanok, Jubilees, and Jasher in the same book in the Spanish language. So it's a, it's a uh, significant text for the, for the Latin, Latino world, and we pray that people will be blessed by that. In addition, we do have a collector's edition that's going to be coming out here very soon. It's going to be a very large book, a very well-printed book. 
Um, and uh, it's going to be in a 14 point font. It's going to be a large font book. And it's going to be, this book can actually be used for, a, you know, a family set of scriptures, or if you're uh, an institution and you want to have this for a large body, like in your fellowship where you're, you're dealing, you want to have one formal text that's available. It, it, this is going to be a limited edition. There'll only be 500 books. I'd like to remind you too that Sefer Radio is coming and uh, Sefer Moments, uh, the videos will continue to expand. Plus, uh, we're going to be launching Sefer Academy, which is going to be an online schooling, online schooling on uh, the scriptures as found in the Ed Sefer. So with that, Baruch Atah Adonai, Elohim Elech Alam, Hashem Natan Lanu, Ederech Hayesh, Ba Mashiach, Yehu Shah Mashiach, Baruch Atah, Chavrim, Ba Hashem, Yehu Shah Mashiach. Blessings and peace and shalom to all of you. Thank you for joining me. And may you all be richly blessed and the name be, the name of Yehuah be glorified in you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we will see you again next time.